you so much. You can hear me well, right? Well, mic works, I guess. OK, great. Uh, thank you so much for taking time this afternoon um, uh, to, to listen to the story of a journalist in exile. I'm sure there are better and more enjoyable things to do in life, uh, especially in college, uh, during college. So I appreciate your time even more. Uh, because after all, Turkey is just one of the countries where there is oppression going on. I'm fully aware that uh, I'm I'm not the first one, first victim of oppression, and I, unfortunately, I'm not going to be the last one either. Um, Turkey, for even for those who have been studying Turkey and has been to Turkey, or even has is from Turkey, it's a complicated country. You know, it keeps surprising everyone, including people, you know, natives like myself. So, uh, if you get confused at any point, please feel free to ask questions because so many things are going to surprise you about. About, you know what's going on so uh, if you think and there is no as, as Americans would say there is no stupid question or simple question feel free to ask anything uh, uh, you know enjoy uh, enjoy your freedom of speech while you have it okay I hope you will have it continue to have it of course I have no doubt about it uh, so here I am, I am a journalist in exile. I finally ended up here, but it's not been easy. Uh, I will tell you my, my st uh, you know, uh, what, what happened, what uh, drifted Turkey into dictatorship in such a short time, despite all the uh, expectations, because after all, Turkey uh, was going on uh, towards Europe, was going in the right direction, as we all thought uh, almost a decade ago. Uh, so right now, Turkey is ruled by President Erdogan, so he has been his government is, has been in power since 2000, late 2002. Uh, at the time. Uh, despite skeptical uh, secular schemalists, I just thought that we should uh, give this government benefit of the doubt and uh, some time because it was the first uh, government that uh, realized the most ex extensive European Union reforms. In its first term, it really did a good job and surprised many other people. And it was not only people like me or uh, the media group, Saman Media Group, which I was not a part of until 2012. Uh, but also international media outlets, um, uh, European Union leaders, um, liberals, uh, even non-Muslim minorities in Turkey were supportive of the Erdogan government because, uh, first of all, it uh, eased up, uh, some of the oppression that dates back to the uh, foundation of uh, modern Turkey. Because Turkey, for years, for decades, it has a tight understanding of secularism. To many surpri surprise, uh, wearing a Scarf, hijab uh, was forbidden in Turkey in civil service and in higher education institutions. Uh, right now, pretty much the opposite is, is taking place. So Turkey is moving from one extreme towards the other. Uh, but at the time, when during Erdogan's initial term, I just thought that it was uh, it was it finally strike strike it was finally striking the right balance between Islam and democracy and showing the world that these are compatible. I still believe that these are compatible, but. Uh, um, you know, it's a whole other debate, but I think in our part of the world we have a serious problem of political culture, especially after, uh, you know, uh, turning out to be wrong about my expectations. Um, so the first real significant signs of oppression and authoritarianism uh, emerged with the uh, protest of Gezi Park uh, in summer of 2013. Um, it was uh, seemingly over a park, but uh, green one of the few green spaces left in Istanbul. Uh, but obviously, it was um, it was the um, uh, appearance of um, accumulated frustration against Erdogan way of governing, uh, because uh, even though people find him blunt, you know, uh, term him one of us, you know, type of guy. Uh, the elites uh, he always had problem with the seculars, with with the elites, uh, uh, because people. Uh, tend to perceive him um, uh, having a hidden agenda uh, of bringing um, Islamist uh, authoritarianism into country. But since I just thought that actions always speak uh, louder than words and people could change, I, you know, and speaking, uh, looking at the actions of the government, I just thought that, you know, they have changed. Um, so starting with the Gezi Park protest, um, Erdogan uh, visibly put pressure on media. Uh, 
uh, targeted news, uh, co certain columnists and uh, talked to uh, actual called on media owners to fire people openly. Later on, it turned out that um, this has been an ongoing trend. It has been uh, going on for a long time behind closed doors. We have learned about all these later on, of course. Uh, I mean, some people, of course, knew it within the media business, but I, at the time I was, I was uh, in bureaucracy. Uh, so this, after this urban revolt was, um, uh, was suppressed brutally by the uh, police, uh, it became clear that Turkey was, uh, at the time, a majoritarian democracy, not a pluralist democracy. But if you ask me, the real turning point was December 2013, uh, at the time of twin corruption investigations. Um, Turkey always had a fragile democracy. I'm not, not going to claim that everything was perfect before Erdogan uh, turned out to be oppressive. But um, it was so, uh, more or less a functioning democracy with elections, uh, somewhat, somewhat independent judiciary, somewhat, somewhat in you know, a pluralist media. Uh, but the, um, when uh, a massive corruption investigation broke out in December 2013, which implicated Erdogan and his family, Erdogan went crazy, uh, called this uh, investigations a coup d'etat against his government, an attempt to undermine Turkey and Turkish government because the foreign powers were jealous of Turkey, you know, developing Turkey, and of course uh, all of a sudden an internal and also have somewhat external, according to them, enemy called the Gulen movement or according to them the pale state at the time, now they call it, a, you know, they argue that it's a terrorist organization. All of a sudden the Gulen movement and uh, Muslims um, social religious grassroots uh, movement which was praised by the government for years turned out to be the enemy mainly because uh, the Erdogan government held police officers and prosecutors and judges uh, who are allegedly sympathetic to the uh, movement responsible for the corruption investigation. So uh, at the time, about four years ago, um, when uh, this prime, this guy, you might wonder who this guy is. Uh, I don't know how many of you read about him in the US media, because currently this Iranian guy, which who holds Turkish citizenship as well, um, this guy was the prime suspect of the corruption investigation. But right now he is jailed in the United States. How come? He was cleared of all corruption charges four years ago. Uh, you know, he was even praised by the pro-government media for contributing to the Turkish economy. And uh, uh, despite, you know, all the, uh, you know, um, praise, praise that is going on in, in Turkey, when he landed in the United States in March last year, uh, he was arrested uh, for evading U.S. sanctions against Iran by bribing uh, people, including high-level Turkish officials, including ministers. So right now, even though that corruption investigation was shut down and you know, aborted and even reversed, um, uh, right now, there, is an, there, there has been arrest warrants against tur former Turkish ministers who were the, uh, you know, actors of this corruption investigation. So if you ask me, the gist of the matter is always, 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 and will always be this uh, corruption investigation. No matter what la happened later on, the controversial coup attempt, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the fight between the Gulen movement and the government, the purge, everything dates back to this date because in order to keep uh, in power, in order to prevent being accountable in one way or, or other, Erdogan has to stay in power. So towards that goal, uh, since December 2013, the government reversed the uh, due process, judicial process, uh, prosecutors and judges, police officers, everyone who was involved in that corruption investigation have been arrested. They have, most of them are, have been in jail for over three years. So um, the pressure also began to affect us because, uh, you know, remember Erdogan uh, declared the Gulen movement as an enemy of the state, the parallel, parallel state, you know, viruses, leeches, all kinds, you know, uh, uh, what was the other, other thing? I th yeah. 
viruses and microbes, uh, you know, among other things, yeah, like like you know, pretty much the same language with Hitler used to, uh, you know, um, uh, employ for his uh, enemies, critics. Um, so um, because our media group was uh, perceived uh, as part of the Gulen movement, well, I, I, of course it was there was a significant number of people um, who were uh, sympathetic towards his teachings, Gulen's teachings, and uh, the movement supporting movement's activities. Uh, but um, in my experience, uh, throughout five years that I've been a part of this media group, um, I was always an I was always independent. And I always felt free to cover whatever I wa wanted to cover. Um, but of course, in a country like Turkey, in which Erdogan actually instructs uh, media buses uh, to cover uh, to, uh, to, to cover what uh, and what not to cover, it's very uh, difficult to believe for many people, including some of the intelligentsia in Turkey. So I am not going to spend time trying to convince you know uh, non-believers that that I was a uh, free journalist at the time. Uh, as far as the editorial line is concerned, or uh, you know, previous, uh, you know, some other, some mistakes in the editorial line. This is a whole other issue, and that, that are debatable. But it's it's uh, you know, at the time, Zaman Media Group was the largest target of Erdogan, and finally, in December 2014, uh, the police uh, raided the newspaper for the first time to detain the then editor in chief uh, and. Um, uh, among uh, with others, uh, actually, uh, and the next day, the following days, actually, our loyal readership uh, stood vigil in front of the paper, in front of the uh, uh, in front of the courthouse and the police station, everywhere. It was a huge deal. But unfortunately, uh, the ma so-called mainstream Turkish media, which has been silent, more and more silent since the Gezi protest, uh, they did not even cover. Uh, you know that major uh, police raid uh, against our newspaper. Instead, uh, there was uh, um, extensive foreign media coverage, uh, and um, uh, you know they they tend to the majority of the media in Turkey tend to uh, portray it as uh, as um, anti-terror terror, uh, investigations. This is a photo that I take, you know, um, dearly, if you will, uh, mainly because this photo will represent a Turkey that, that does not exist anymore. Uh, and I don't think uh, it will ever be, I mean, at least in the foreseeable future, it's not going to be possible to bring those people together because most of them are jailed. This is the editorial board, uh, in editorial uh, a team of Zaman Media Group and today's Zaman and the other uh, organization, other uh, outlets of the same media organization, following the release of the editor in chief. Uh, those days, um, you know, we thought that the pressure was high, but in retrospect, I realized that those were, you know. Better. Those were even better days because it's not even possible to uh, do it assemble like this anymore. So these people, most of them are in exile, uh, um, um, in prison, or wanted. Uh, so this is this is history now. Um, unfortunately, uh, the pressure was not limited to our media organization. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Turkish politics was, as always, uh, you know, as always eventful. Uh, in June of 2014, uh, for the first time in national elections, Erdogan government lost majority in the parliament. Uh, because of the, you know, uh, because of you know, um, grieving frustration. Of course, he still had popular support. His party was the number one party because uh, he has been controlling a huge media machine for a long time. But uh, when uh, in June he lost uh, the majority in the parliament, uh, one way or other he want, he made it possible to have repeat elections in November the first that year, even though the, the elections were perfectly legitimate. Um, so so a few days before the election, uh, because there was less and less tolerance towards any uh, free and independent media or something
something different aside from the narrative of the government. The, this time, um, uh, the, the police targeted Bugün TV, and uh, the owner of which uh, has sympathies towards Mr. Gulen. Uh, but it was, you know, a popular, very, a very widely watched TV station news channel. And since its closure, by the way, it was police inter intervened, and in the control room. Um, uh, the editor-in-chief, who is also in exile right now, uh, Mr. Tarek Toros, he locked himself inside the control room until police intervened and cut off the, the broadcast live. So all of a sudden, the viewers, you know, uh, saw a screen going, you know, bl black. You know, it was live on air, you know, in 2015. Uh, I think this was another turning point because, despite uh, the widespread impact of the TV station. Except a few major, uh, uh, opposition deputies, not many people support. You know, uh, stood against this oppression, and due to uh, fragmentation and polarization among different groups in Turkey, uh, people tend to favor only their interests. I mean, this is valid for every social group. You know, uh, it's, no social group is immune from this this problem in Turkey, unfortunately. So, um, had there been a stronger reaction, uh, the arrival of the Dictatorship, uh, you know, could have been stopped, I believe, but it, it's too late. This is me uh, during the uh, r shortly before the second and final police raid against our newspaper. In the meantime, some others also took place, but they were uh, small ones, so I'm not going to mention them. Uh, so pressure kept rising. It was a matter of time following Erdogan's, uh, you know, victory in the November elections. This time he secured a uh, majority in the parliament, and it was a matter of time that a police crackdown could take place. And uh, on uh, March 4, we received a so-called court decision s saying that we were supporters of terrorism, and uh, and that's why the government seized the paper. So before the police arrived, before the uh, paper was confiscated, we just wanted to finish the final uncensored edition of the paper, um, and uh, and I had to flee Turkey only two days after. Uh, so this was pretty much my, uh, like my last work, active work day in the paper. On that day, uh, again, even more, even a bigger crowd of readers gathered outside the uh, building, and we addressed them. This time, even a bigger international media coverage took place. But again, as always, um, almost no Turkish media outlets there to interview with us. They didn't even bother to ask our opinion. And uh, the, the, you know, we addressed the reader, readers um, and, and the uh, international media shortly before the police raid. This is uh, one of the scenes from the police raid on that night. Uh, police forcefully broke, in, broke the uh, iron gate and entered the building around midnight. There were few members of the opposition who were supporting us. Uh, and, uh, but aside from that, you know, I just felt that we were left to our own devices. Um, again, th that was a heartbreaking uh, night for me at the time, but uh, compared to the brutality of the purge that is going on right now, it's nothing. Uh, because even this much protest is not possible anymore in Turkey. And these readers that have been uh, brutally uh, dispersed by the police that day and the following day, right now some of them are jailed mainly because subscription to Zaman Daily is reason enough to be jailed in Turkey. You know, it's considered an evidence of terrorist activity in Turkey, believe it or not. These are another, uh, um, yeah, uh, other scenes from that day. Uh, the new administration immediately fired the editor in chief. I, I was waiting for them to fire me, but they didn't fire me right away. Uh, so um, after publishing this final issue, they immediately imposed censorship and wanted to remove some of the columns. And I said, I don't want my name to appear uh, in in the censored edition of the paper. Uh, so uh, we argued and all, and I just. Um, and talking to uh, the, the fire editor in chief, along with and other colleagues who live abroad, uh, they encouraged me to leave the country because sooner or later they were going to come after me. Because, because even at the time, there were num uh, you know, more than enough. I mean, a great deal of a great number of people, journalists, were already behind bars anyway. Uh, so uh, just two days after the um, uh, crackdown, uh, 
I packed in a few hours, uh, bought my ticket online, and then flew to Brussels. People keep asking me why Brussels, because our newspaper had an office, had a representative in Brussels who, who was also a close friend of mine, and I just thought that initially it was convenient and uh, you know cheaper to get there, more convenient, shorter, and ahead of the European Union. So I thought that we could uh, continue telling about our situation in Europe. A few days after, a New York Times asked me to write an op-ed, but following that op-ed, uh, I became uh, an enemy of the state and the people, according to the uh, to the government supporters, the government um, um, government uh, hitman in media. Uh, I also appeared in the BBC Hard Talk, uh, and um, the host asked me why I did not choose to continue my struggle in Turkey, within Turkey, um, mainly because there was no rule of law left, and there was no f you know, independent judiciary, so there, it would be too naive and, in my opinion, unnecessary to stay and, you know, and continue and suffer in the hands of a, a dictator in Turkey, so I left uh, without any future plans, to be honest. And unfortunately, time proved me right, and worse, much worse things happened. In the meantime, uh, I received a fellowship from CUNY in New York, in Manhattan, and I was uh, I, I happily admitted it because it was kind of a lifeline for me at the time. So I was getting ready to fly to the United States on July 27 uh, last year, and you probably know the infamous date, July 15. Uh, as Erdogan calls it, gift of God. Why Erdogan called a coup attempt, a you know, so-called coup attempt, gift of God? Uh, even though 250 civilians died upon his call, you know, uh, mainly because it provided a perfect pretext for massive purge. Uh, the very next day, uh, mass detentions, dismissals, uh, purges uh, took place. Uh, hundreds of uh, media organizations, thousands of schools were shut down. Of course, uh, the, the, the perpetrator was already, you know, clear. Uh, it was the Gulen movement, which was, according to Erdogan, from day, from not even from day one, from our one actually. He knew for sure who uh, committed that uh, controversial coup attempt, uh, uh, over which there are still so many unanswered questions. But whether, uh, who, whether uh, whoever and why committed or organized this, uh, and according to some stage, according to some uh, stage, this night. Uh, it is. It turned out clear that the Turkish intelligence, uh, the president, and some other officials, even some marginal members of the opposition, knew about uh, this coup attempt, and they let it happen at the expense of lives and instability of the country. Because it would allow Erdogan to, you know, um, sort of rally people around the flag and continue his purge and rule without any um, impunity or accountability. So uh, a rule of emergency declared and is still in place to this day. And I don't think it will ever be removed under his rule because there is always a quote-unquote terrorist threat in the country. Unfortunately, so many people I know and I don't know have been victims of the purge. This is a, a guy who is the... Um, uh, who, who is one of the renowned liberal intellectuals of the country. His only crime was to write for Daily Zaman. Um, hundreds of journalists were arrested, and an arrest warrant was issued against me on July 26 or 7, I'm not really sure, because the police raided my place uh, in Istanbul on July 27, the very same day that I had a flight to United States. So in the meantime, I kept receiving, uh, it was some of the worst days of my life, I guess, you know, like for anybody else. Even though I was not in Turkey, I realized that, you know, life was becoming unbearable. I, was, I couldn't even imagine what was it like for people who had to go through this in Turkey. Uh, so that threat smear campaign from Erdogan supporters, it was already a part of our, you know, normal life. Uh, but, it, you know, they became uh, much more intense. And and 
uh, in the meantime, the, newspa the, uh, the lawyers of the newspaper is also arrested. So unfortunately, right now, there is no right to defense in the country. So um, uh, I mean, in a place where even lawyers uh, are not uh, are not you know free from immune from detention, you cannot talk about judi independent judiciary, of course. So on July 27. Uh, my parents were home and it was raided by the police as I heard from a neighbor. Uh, and she told me to delete her uh, direct messages on Twitter right after she wrote me because she was scared too. Uh, uh, made, I mean, she had every reason to because right now, at, at least at the time, there were over 10,000 people, social media users, who, have been, who had been investigated because of their social media posts. Um, so um, as if it was not depressing enough, uh, and I learned about the arrest warrant as well, uh, but I was you know, safe and secure in Brussels. But uh, I just didn't know that I was going to be removed from a plane that day because the regime could not take enough revenge and they wanted to uh, cancel the York passport of critics overnight. So over 50,000 passports uh, in the immediate, immediate aftermath of the coup attempt, over 50,000 passports were canceled. But right now, uh, you know, people don't even know whether in Turkey, if, if they are in Turkey, they, they don't even know whether their passports, uh, you know, are you know, valid or not until they try to fly. So oftentimes the people who are purged, they don't even attempt to, uh, you know, go through normal ways. And like Syrian refugees, they pay the uh, human traffickers so that they could uh, get away from Turkey. Just yesterday, uh, a 14-year-old son of a purge victim, apparently who made it abroad, uh, the purge victim's son was caught in a suitcase uh, at the border of Georgia and Turkey because uh, knowing that it was impossible to flee your home country freely, leave your home country freely, these people probably you know, resorted to some other ways. And, and unfortunately, mainstream media, inclu including uh, Turkish affiliate of CNN, uh, CNN Turk, uh, d uh, reported this as if you know, some sort of a criminal was uh, captured. So anyway, I was removed by, uh, off the plane. It was uh, embarrassing because, uh, I mean, of course, I didn't do anything wrong, but I imagine the looks and all, you know, just minutes before, before the flight. It was such a disappointment because my plans for the next year were ruined. And I just, uh, I shed some uh, uh, tears and you know cried. It was depressed for a couple of days, and then I decided to move on. Uh, and uh, it, even though it was difficult, so but for uh, in the meantime, international authorities realized that these uh, passport cancel cancellations were suspicious. Uh, they were arbitrary. So I was able to receive my passport back. But but at the time, uh, I already changed my plans. I prioritized my uh, security first. I could. Not not rely on my passport anymore. Um, on top of everything, I, I was reporting in English with a, uh, with a bunch of journalists in exile in Belgium. We were all over the world, actually, Europe and the world, with very limited resources. I was uh, reporting with my little uh, laptop from home, uh, and uh, some other friend who fled Turkey could not really type because the German keyboard was not something that she was used to, so she was slow and somebody uh, landed her, her uh, a new laptop, etc. So these are, I think uh, one day we should definitely turn these into movies. Uh, but I mean, some, uh, once, once all these are over. Uh, on top of everything, uh, I was among the um, I was among the journalists whose properties, assets were frozen. I never thought that I would feel happy that I didn't own anything. Uh, so because I had nothing, uh, no, no deed or no title, no nothing, I had so sold my car fortunately before, uh, right after I left Turkey. I mean, it was uh, possible back then. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the government wasn't able to seize anything that belongs to me. I mean, because I didn't have any. But uh, the, my bank accounts uh, and credit cards were, you know, frozen. 
but compared to what other people are going through, it's um, really nothing because I know people's, uh, people who were among the richest in Turkey, but after the government sees their properties, businesses, they are almost, by their standards, penniless abroad and they have to start from scratch. It's pretty depressing. So finally, I made it here uh, in May uh, of this year with a journalist visa, and I'm trying to speak out on behalf of, you know, these purge victims. Uh, you might heard that uh, um, uh, you might heard the fame of uh, Erdogan's bodyguards in Washington. Uh, they beat up peaceful protesters right in the heart of Washington D.C. Uh, and, uh, and when the United States issued arrest warrants against those uh, thugs uh, and protesters, uh, Erdogan got angry. Recently, I guess two or f a couple of days ago, he said he accused the United States of not being a civilized enough country. Uh, uh, so he said, how dare you, how dare you arrest my, uh, issue arrest warrant against my um, bodyguards uh, while he has been jailing even babies in Turkey just because of their real or perceived affiliations to a social or religious movement, whatever you name it. Um, but even, uh, by the way, uh, I don't know whether you heard that as well, but um, a U.S. pastor, an American pastor, uh, is, uh, has been in jail in Turkey too, along with some other Americans, American citizens. Some are Turkish American citizens, some American, American citizens. But guess what this American pastor is accused of? It shouldn't be difficult after what I told you. As, uh, even though it's surreal, Guess what his, his crime is? No guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's accused of having Gülen's ties, secret Gülen's ties. So they are, you know, of course, uh, Gülen movement has been accused for everything that goes under the sky, not only in Turkey, but in the world. I mean, according to the government, it also has control, secret control over the United States. Um, but despite everything, people who are affiliated with this moment, we have to deal with immigration issues, you know, money issues, all kinds of issues. That's, that's a weird kind of power, I guess. So um, this pastor, um, the, the, the current administration and the previous administration as well, they have been pressing, actually calling on Turkish government to release this pastor. But what was the last straw was detention of three uh, staff members of the U.S. Embassy and Consulate in Turkey in the last couple of weeks. They were Turkish citizens, um, but they were officially employed by the US uh, diplomatic missions. Uh, and unsurprisingly, they are also accused of being Gülenists. So according to them, uh, the, the government, these guys have secret connections with the Gülen movement and uh, helped orchestrate the coup attempt in Turkey. Of course, you don't need to ask for evidence. It's pointless, you know, uh, because there is no need for evidence to be detained or arrested in Turkey. So, uh, as a result of this crisis, uh, two weeks ago, I guess, or a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, visa applications from the United States, from Turkey to the United States, uh, have been suspended. In return, Turkey also suspended visas for Americans. But Americans don't need visas to travel to the United States. So uh, uh, it's an, uh, I think, humiliating retaliation for any state. But you know, um, anyway, it's, well, everything is nonsense enough already. So these are some of the figures. I'll give you some of the figures of the arrested journalists and um, wanted journalists. Uh, these numbers keep changing. It's like the stock market, you know. Uh, every single day there are more journalists. Uh, the purge continues for sure. Uh, you know, uh, every single day you, you wake up to news of purge, increasing number of people detained over Gülen links. So these numbers vary. The point is, uh, depending on the criteria, different organizations use different numbers. But the point is, by far, Turkey is the largest trader of journalists. And as if, uh, you know, uh, seizing their assets, deten detaining, arresting journalists, it's not, it's not uh, punishment enough. Uh, even worse, uh, and, and uh, as an intimid intimidation tactic, the government targets families. I think 
that's a, that that was a Nazi practice called Zippenhaft, uh, um, and people just because of their blood ties to you know criminals or perceived criminals or alleged criminals are targeted uh, in a mafia style punishment. So I know personally uh, colleagues whose family members are have been had been imprisoned. Um, and this, these are some of the figures of the uh, latest, uh, latest uh, ongoing, uh, ongoing purge, latest picture of the ongoing purge. Uh, every single day, they, 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 these numbers uh, increase. But I just uh, wanted to uh, wanted you to see this to have an idea about the scope of the purge. So there are some interesting. I mean, uh, these are confirmed by official uh, authorities as well. Uh, this is interesting. Oh, nearly um, 5,000 judges, prosecutors are dismissed. Some of them are jailed. There are at least two top constitutional court co uh, judges who have been jailed. So imagine how free and independent decisions you know, judges could make in Turkey under these conditions. Academics are under pressure. They are not only accused by uh, being Gulenist because it food, and they have to have some sort of other accusations because it's not cred you know, uh, credible enough. So sometimes they're accused of being members of the PKK, uh, you know, Kurdish separatists, etc. Uh, and media outlets are shut down and following the coup attempt, as if schools, universities, dormitories had anything to do with the coup attempt, they were looted. They, some of, some bookstores that were, according to them, linked to the Gulen movement or owned by people uh, who were sympathetic towards that movement, uh, they were uh, looted and they, I was watching, uh, as if I was watching scenes like from uh, Taliban's Afghanistan or Boko Haram, you know, people targeting educational institutions, you know, uh, ruining schools and all. It was uh, surreal, so heartbreaking. And I, that's why I'm angry at the Turkish people and the Turkish intelligentsia as well, because uh, even if, for one second, even if we, uh, we believe, or even if there is evidence that the Gulen movement committed this, or people who are close to the Gulen movement committed this uh, coup attempt, what do nearly 700 babies, you know, or over 70,000 women have to do with the coup attempt? In Turkey's uh, overcrowded in prisons right now, there are 668 uh, babies and um, tod uh, infants and toddlers. Uh, they are malnutrition because uh, they are not provided any uh, any. Um, baby food formula uh, they have to have the, uh, share their the poor food that their mothers are given and these mothers are you know teachers uh, uh, so uh, charity workers uh, housewives you know people from uh, all walks of life but mostly regular Turkish citizens regular peaceful Turkish citizens whose only crime uh, was having some sort of sympathy towards the Gulen movement uh, and it's not uncommon for Turkish police to detain women right after delivery. Uh, because most of the women in, uh, in, uh, who are wanted, they had to go to hospital when, um, when they, um, uh, you know, when they, well, obviously, when they need to have to deliver. So the police uh, wait outside and take them to, you know, to courts, to prisons. Uh, this is so brutal, but it's, it's, it's not fiction. Uh, and in this age, I heard cases in which pregnant women are scared of going to a hospital uh, out of fear of detention. So some people were, you know, looking for trustworthy midwives who would not inform them to government. This is 2017. In the meantime, uh, the purge is not limited to detentions, arrests, or confiscation of private property, but also abductions, uh, uh, forced disappearances, uh, and torture. Uh, recently, two educators in Pakistan who were, uh, uh, who were uh, teachers and uh, administrators in uh, Gulen-linked schools in Pakistan. Uh, they were uh, abducted and brought back to Turkey by a private plane, uh, you know, and this was portrayed by the mainstream media uh, as a counter-terrorism operation. 
everybody, including those who made the, those reports, knew that these people could not have done anything violent, or they, they did not have even supported you know, violence throughout their lifetime because they were peaceful educators. Uh, so this is only some part of the, in a nutshell, this is what's going on in today's Turkey, my home country, which I cannot recognize anymore. Uh, so I'm here, I'm hopeless for the near foreseeable future of the country, but I still want to do my share uh, on behalf of all these people, my colleagues, friends, people I don't know, those babies, women, who think that them, they might have been forgotten and nobody is doing anything for them. I don't I don't know what difference it could make, uh, but I know that international pressure uh, pays off because just yesterday, because of uh, uh, a consistent international pressure, uh, 10 detained members of the Amnesty International in Turkey, uh, they were released. They were released as a, as a result of negotiation between Erdogan and Germany. So we don't know what uh, what was the bargain about, but uh, it was announced that you know former German Prime Minister had to bargain with Erdogan. Uh, but I mean, th these were well connected, internationally known human rights activists. What about the regular people, you know, defenseless, innocent people who have no voice? So as a journalist, you know, uh, one definition of journalism is to be the voice of the voiceless. Uh, so I'm, that's what I'm trying to do, you know, in a remote place. I just, uh, I know, and I thank you all for paying attention to this oppression because normally, I mean, there are uh, several oppression, uh, I mean, um, uh, tragedies going on in different parts of the world in time. But uh, even if not for humanitarian reasons, people should care for political reasons because Turkey is a NATO ally, a so-called Euro European Union candidate country, well, not anymore in practice, of course. Uh, but as a NATO ally, it's been moving uh, far and f further and further away from uh, you know, Western values in terms of democracy. Uh, and um, it seems that the United States has been putting up with, the, with, with, with uh, a clearly oppressive leader, mainly because of its strategic location, its interest in the region, because Turkey hosts a very important air base uh, for America. And, uh, um, but I think uh, despite uh, uh, all the short-term interest, it's clear that an unstable and unpredictable Turkey would lead to more headache in the region for everyone. Um, Turkey could have been an inspiration for, all, for the rest of the Muslim world, I think, uh, because of its unique character. You know, after all, it was a place where you could pray, hear the pr uh, call to prayer, but also drink alcohol freely at the same time. So, uh, so many Arabs, Middle Easterns, I know, you know, from personal experience that they loved traveling to Turkey. They so, uh, you know, wanted Turkey to, wanted their countries to become like Turkey in terms of lifestyle. But um, unfortunately, nowadays that dream has been killed as well, uh, because probably the, one of the most open-minded and westernized Islam, Muslim, social Muslim uh, uh, movements with, with Muslim roots is being exterminated and replaced by radicals and bigots in Turkey. So uh, this is pretty much it. Um, in case you would like to contact me, there is my email. I also recently activated my Twitter account, despite all the fears of my you know, loved ones back in Turkey, because when you are visible in social media, they target you even more. But you know, I only tweet in English. I just uh, shut down my Twitter account in Turkish, even though it was the official account and all. Uh, so um, that's it. And I, am, I would be more than happy to hear your questions and answer any ambiguous parts if you if you are confused. Thank you. Go ahead, please. And I would appreciate if you uh, introduce yourself, you know, just out of curiosity, and I'm wondering. Nancy Macduff, and I had the chance to travel with the Atlantic Institute to Turkey just before uh, closure. Uh huh. And uh, what year? 2013. 13. Okay, right before you know things get much, much worse. Yeah. 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 So, thank you for your courage.
and for taking time to help educate us on the issue. I'm curious how your family is doing. Uh, they tell me to keep quiet. Uh, and I can't blame them. Uh, but at the same time, this is my job. Uh, and more importantly, uh, I feel sort of a moral obligation uh, about my imprisoned colleagues. I put myself in their shoes. And if, I, if one of my colleagues who is fluent in English and who has some sort of connections was ke uh, keeping silent, even though she could talk, I guess I would feel resentful against her. So um, as much as I'm worried about my own family, uh, I have parents and siblings. I don't have an immediate family. I'm single and childless. So uh, maybe this, for the first time in my life, this could be an advantage uh, that I'm sort of independent. If you know, independent soul who can travel everywhere. And um, people oftentimes, those, those, these uh, purge victims, they keep telling me, "Oh, Sevgi, you are so lucky because you have no family, no dependents. You could move wherever you like under these conditions." Of course, they under the pressure of uh, you know of taking care of a family, they tell us. But it's it's equally, if not more, difficult to try to tackle with all these by yourself. Uh, but right now, as long as you know my family, my loved ones are fine. I mean, there is normal under normal conditions, there is no reason for them to be targeted. But for uh, you know thousands of other people, there is no reason. This this morning, I learned that uh, a remote relative was detained because another relative with mental issues called the police and said that all male members of that family are Gulenists. So police raided their house. So this is, this is as simple as that. If someone calls up and says that you are a secret Gulenist, uh, you know, they search your house. If they find a one dollar bill, I'm, I'm not making this up. If, you, if uh, police searches your house, and if a one dollar bill is found your house, in your house, you might be a secret Gulenist, according to Turkish judges and prosecutors. Because, well, I, I'm sort of close to the Gulen movement, and I've never heard anyone distributing dollars or one dollars, for that matter. Uh, but apparently, according to the Turkish government, I don't know how they, they, they came up with this conclusion, but according to them, Gulen movement uh, distributes uh, uh, F-series $1 bills to its members for identification. I don't know what the purpose, you know, is, you know, it sounds very, very stupid to me, even if they did something like this. So, um, you know, this sounds like a joke, but it's not, it's happening. Uh, that's more frustrating. Um, as far as, you know, I mean, I'm frustrated with all this purge and it feels as if it's not, not going to end anytime soon. And I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. Uh, but we have to, you know, uh, put up with it. We have to go through it. Like many other groups in society, many other, you know, uh, people from different, you know, um, affiliations, nationalities, beliefs, you know, went through. They, I, mean, I think maybe this is helping us to understand and, you know, the ordeal of other people. Because I need in theory, oh, of course, it must be difficult to be in exile. Now, now I experience it. So it's pretty humbling on the one hand uh, and, and very, uh, very uh, 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 teaching me a lot. Uh, Could you please speak up, sir? Ram Verma. Uh huh. Uh, I traveled in Turkey 2007 with my wife. Experience. And I'm very sad to see what, what is happening and hearing what, what you just described. Uh, can you very briefly tell how other countries' leadership is trying to affect, particularly the US and the Western Europe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just a couple of examples. Sure, sure. Um, of course, they are not happy with working, being have to put up with Erdogan, put up, uh, you know, tolerate Erdogan. Uh, on, on a funny note, uh, the newly elected president of France, Macron, 
when he was interviewed, uh, the journalist said, oh, it must be a nice thing, cool thing to be the president of France at such a young age. And he said, hey, you know, it's not always as pleasant as it looks. After all, I am the one who needs to talk to Erdogan to release French journalists in Turkey. So uh, this is the type of approach they have. Uh, German, uh, Germany is often uh, portrayed as the enemy of Turkey. And uh, because they are pursuing a more rational rather than emotional policy towards Turkey, uh, their responses are somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, proportionate. Uh, they condemn, call Turkey to, uh, you know, uh, to liberate people, to end purge, etc. Uh, there has been detentions uh, in Germany of Erdogan supporters for charges of espionage because so many imams in Turkey supported mosques have been uh, uh, have been profiling Gülen supporters. So if you go to a Turkish mosque in Germany and if you are somewhat a sympathizer of the Gülen movement, uh, you could easily make it to the blacklist of the Turkish government. So Germany detected this and they have been fighting against this. And because Germany is, you know, doing what it has to do in Turkey, pro-government media is accusing Germany of being Gülenist as well. Um, as far as the European Union in general is concerned, of course, the more, most important actors are Germany and France. These are the driving forces of the European Union. Uh, but uh, in general, the European Union is very much concerned, has been concerned about the uh, influx of refugees. So in order to stop, and Erdogan is a smart, you know, I mean, canny politician. So uh, he knew, how, he knows how to bargain, negotiate. Uh, so um, in return for containing millions of refugees, refugees inside Turkey and uh, outside Europe, uh, unfortunately, they have been keeping a somewhat, uh, you know, silent uh, attitude, and you know, they make statements, condemn, call for release of political prisoners, etc., etc. Uh, but it's not been proving effective, and even threatening Turkey to, uh, you know, to exclude Turkey from the European Union negotiation uh, process would play into the play, uh, hands of Erdogan, because in this case he would say, "See, they are enemies." of Turkey, they don't want us. We are not one of us. They don't want us because we are Muslim. They don't want us because we are getting stronger. That kind of you know, populist rhetoric. Uh, and uh, he couldn't care less about be, uh, you know, being disconnected from Europe because being a member of European Union would mean more accountability, checks and balances, you know, free media and other you know, criteria of the modern world. Uh, some other, uh, you ask about Western, uh, Erdogan is getting close to Russia as it's you know, in search for new allies. It has been getting closer to Putin. After all, they are of the same estate. They have the same character, both uh, bullies. So, um, and I think bullies understand each other's language. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, a language of appeasement is not going to work in this in Turkish case, I believe. And less democratic countries like Pakistan and other places sometimes they cooperate, as I told you in the case of abductions. So it depends on the region and government. So, so may I have to prove that other than the words, there is no tangible action by other than Excuse me? So may I conclude that other than the words, there are no tangible actions that are being taken by other uh, The most tangible action has been suspending use visa applications uh, by the US. And uh, the, the German banks, as far as I can follow, stop some of the investment projects in Europe. So it's, they are taking action slowly, but not significant enough to uh, uh, dissuade Erdogan, I guess. My name is Gila Karpnar, I'm a professor at the University of Georgia. I just want to hear your take on the Gila movement and what is your opinion if they have made some mistakes during this purge or before the purge? Mm -hmm. And if you think they have made some mistakes, uh, do you think they can improve on these mistakes? I just want to take you know, opinion. Uh, yeah, that's a very long question because Gula movement is not a monolithic you know, movement as many argue or believe. 
and I am not a person uh, who an expert on the Gulen movement or in any way I don't represent the Gulen movement but of course I have my opinions as I know many people from the mo uh, movement and I like the movement for its contribution to education and I think it was pretty much the only um, uh, movement within the modern Turkish Republic that made possible uh, social upward mobility for middle classes, lower middle classes and uh, rural Anatolian people who would be otherwise you know stuck in their villages uh, the movement encouraged them motivated them to go around the globe and you know uh, achieve things that they could not even have imagined so uh, I always praise this movement for its contribution positive contributions to society and the world at large but this does not mean that like any social movement you know this is made up of uh, made of uh, people human beings and where there are human beings there are mistakes uh, and uh, oftentimes the movement has been criticized for not being transparent enough uh, and uh, I see the point in that respect because I think that that lack of transparency uh, argument comes from the I hate the argument that special conditions of Turkey but this movement was born in Turkey it was not born in Switzerland or in the United States so in a country where people could not practice their religion freely the country in which people were persecuted or dismissed from military police other government offices because of if if their religious identity is visible uh, it's kind of understandable that people with this uh, affiliated with this movement or sympathetic to this movement chose not to uh, not to make their religiosity or piety visible it does not necessarily you know people are accusing this movement of hiding you know its intentions and all uh, I don't think there is anything wrong with the intentions but um, in retrospect maybe uh, the movement globally and within Turkey could have made clear why uh, it has been why it's different from the uh, Islamic movement political Islamist movements within Turkey how it reconciles modernity and uh, you know Islam while these people are mostly religious practicing people unlike many seculars think assume these people are not Islamists these most of these people are not in favor of religion or Sharia and Caused by the state. On the contrary, they care about agency. They care about individual. They invest in the individual. Of course, they they have their idea of you know. Uh better world, better society. So they encourage people to become more religious. But more than that, because mainly because they just think that people if become if people are more uh, moral and care more about religious values, societies are going to benefit from it. And uh, the way to fight against it is not persecute these people. I mean, uh, in the United States, as we see, there is a, a more liberal version of secularism in which each and every, you know, it's a free market of ideas and movements and everybody is free to do uh, to whatever they want to they just uh, uh, and I think in Turkey uh, with a similar logic even uh, Christian missionaries and minorities or other people have been persecuted in Turkey it's considered as if it's something you know uh, terribly bad you know to try to spread your ideas or you know uh, you know lifestyle of, of course as long as you don't impose it when it comes to being a criminal you know there, there is a there is a real Really, really important line between criminal and making mis mistakes. Unfortunately, in today's Turkey, even the mistakes uh, that the people affiliated with the Gulen movement or with perceived affiliations with that movement made, uh, those mistakes or um, misperceptions, uh, you know, mistakes that are done in the media, etc., they are portrayed as if they were criminal activities. Uh, and when it comes to criminality, uh, as we all know, uh, you know there is the individuality of uh, you know any any crime. So if there are any people affiliated with this movement, represented this movement, one way or other, if any person, I always urge people to come up and persecute these people and uh, uh, hold them accountable in front of free and independent courts. But instead, what is going on in Turkey is a collective punishment uh, of anyone, uh, you know, I mean, anyone with, with, with sympathy towards this movement. I mean, how could I be, as a journalist, responsible for, for something that, let's say, an alleged or 
assumed Kulan sympathizers within the military did. I mean, aside from uh, sharing the same world with, uh, I have nothing else to share. You know, uh, I have no responsibility over the actions of other people. But unfortunately, that's very much weak stopped in Turkey. As far as um, uh, you know, I mean, right now it's being stigmatized and demonized. So it's very normal people to be uh, defensive and uh, see uh, or magnify, magnify even smaller mistakes. That being said, I don't think that uh, Gulen movement did not make any mistakes. I think the, not the mistake, but the major problem with the movement, I guess, it's Turkishness and it's being sort of not modernized enough. I mean, in terms of its, it has, uh, f based on my observations, some people still try to conduct business in the Turkish way. Maybe not with bad intentions, uh, but with the same uh, deafness, no, deafness, I guess, yeah, no, uh, with the same um, I'm trying to find the right word, sorry. Uh, with the same oriental list, oriental uh, type of mentality. So uh, when it comes to issues like transparency, uh, accountability, putting everything in record, um, such kind of things, there are so many things that this, this woman could learn and should learn from the Western societies. But uh, on a very subjective note, uh, I have known so many people with uh, affiliated with the movement and by far these are the best people I've ever met in terms of their uh, you know uh, characters their um, uh, attitudes towards others of course there were people that I didn't like and I always um, I, I, because I always assumed that these are the nicest people in Turkey sometimes I was fooled as well you know after all, all human beings share the same greed same you know feelings and uh, uh, flaws. So these people are not immune from mistake, but by far they have represented the best, some of the best of Turkey. That's even more heartbreaking because they have been exterminated. So um, I urge, I know it's been a long answer, uh, I urge the movement to have a, a soul searching as well. Uh, of course people need to ask why do people hate us this much? Uh, I don't think we should blame Jews for being hated by Nazis that much. Uh, you, people don't ask what did uh, Nazi, what did Jews do to deserve all these, you know, purge, extermination at the time. Uh, but I also recognize that you know these are some organizations, some human beings might have been involved in uh, unlawful activities. I can't know that. The problem is there is no independent judiciary, but instead there is collect collective punish punishment and stigmatization because it's so convenient. In the absence of, absence of evidence, you could easily label people and say that they did all kinds of uh, you know, wrongdoings and they are responsible for anything that goes wrong in Turkey. That's much more convenient for everyone in Turkey. And that's why I am extremely disillusioned with my own uh, intelligentsia in Turkey. Because unfortunately, instead of... Um, Instead of um, resisting Erdogan's uh, stigmatization, demonization, they supported the same narrative, mainly because they didn't like uh, the movement because of their prejudice, sometimes prejudices, sometimes sometimes personal reasons. And that's why I am hopeless about the future of my own country because we don't have a uh, we we don't have enough intelligentsia uh, that has integrity. We get back to journalists. My name is Pat Thomas. I've taught journalism here until really recently. I, I'm shocked at the number of journalists arrested and in jail. And I'm wondering whether any of the international organizations that usually advocate for international press freedom, Penn International Committee for Press Freedoms, are, are any of these international journalism organizations trying to? Yeah, they are trying hard. They are trying hard. It's just that they don't have any impact uh, because I, it's too late. Because 
because Erdogan knows no borders and because he has popular support and the control of the and unfortunately the remaining media in Turkey you know they are the public propaganda machine of Erdogan of course I mean even though they call themselves media they are also responsible because uh, they are not they did not uh, challenge the uh, narrative of the government because they didn't want to pay a heavy price so uh, yes international uh, organizations such as committee to protect journalists IPI PAN uh, Reporters Without Borders, all uh, international organizations, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, you name it. All of them are busy with the human rights violations in Turkey at the moment, but they can only do so much. So you need political pressure in the end, I mean, to be realistic. So you were demonized before you were arrested as journalists. Yes. So right now, journalists are being demonized by the present administration here in the U.S. Yeah, uh, it's unbelievable by U.S. standards, and I, I guess unprecedented by your standards. Uh, but the type of narrative, the rhetoric that is used here resembles what I've been he hearing from Erdogan government. I don't, I hope, and I don't think think that it's going to get that worse, that it can't because we have independent judiciary, robust civic society, civil society, free media here, thank God. Uh, but it's still uh, disturbing, of course. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, please. My name is Jim Wilson, and I'm a lecturer in, in English. And my neighbor, Pat, nicely uh, cued me into the lecture, so it's nice to be here, and thank you. Thank you for being here. This may be naive, but I, I wonder, is, 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 I would like to ask, do you believe there would be a possibility for a reconciliation if the, uh, and, and maybe even rapprochement and forgiveness of the Gulen movement um, and secularists in Turkey too, if um, uh, governments like the United States were to effectively forgive the problem of mm -hmm. the Iranian gold trader and, and there would be a, in, in effect a sort of trade. Um, that's a good question. Uh, let me formulate my answer. First of all, the only salvation for the Turkish society would be uniting around universal human values, such as, you know, individuality of crime, avoiding collective punishment, denouncing purge, defending media uh, rights regardless of, uh, you know, ideology of the outlet and everything, media. Outlet. But that's not happening. And that's been emboldening and encouraging Erdogan. So even if Erdogan is gone, that society is going to be there. And personally, I am kind of uh, hopeless about at least for the first year of because the, the time when I thought that finally Turkey was breaking that vicious cycle, I know things got even worse. So next time I'm not going to be fooled because I think we need a major shift in the uh, um, education system. I know it sounds cliche, uh, but people need to learn tolerance towards people who don't look like or think, think like or live like themselves from early ages on. Even the seemingly secular and modern people in Turkey who have this, who share the same lifestyle with Westerners, they can be they they could turn out to be uh, bigots uh, because they often think that oh these are these people are religious these people are not progressive enough these are not secular and the others blame others of being infidels you know not religious enough etc so this is a never ending uh, polarization and struggle unfortunately very few people in Turkey have internalized that political culture that diversity and acceptance of the different and uh, uh, I don't see any reason why it should change as long as it's divisive and uh, hateful rhetoric con uh, continues in Turkey and fueled by the media. And the only way out would be a reconciliation between different groups in Turkey. I don't know how it would happen. Uh, and as far as this uh, perpetrators of the purge concerned, I don't know what Mr. Gulen would preach or other think, others think, but I will never ever forgive those who ruined our lives and who have imprisoned all those babies along with other people. Uh, I, my heart is not that, that big and I'm not that forgiving. So uh, I might dedicate the rest of my life for uh, fighting against these people and trying to bring them you know, uh, into 
course, you know, maybe make them uh, accountable at some point, even though that doesn't seem likely at the moment. I don't want to make this uh, about good, sorry, I'm Kasper, I'm, a, I'm a professor here in international affairs. I don't want to make this about Gulen, but I think you're you're a, a little bit too forgiving about them because I mean, the Gulen movement was very much uh, connected to the Erdogan movement when they came to power, and I think this is one of the reasons why many liberals don't speak out at the moment. Whether it's right or wrong is a different mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. but there is. There is a history. Um, you're, ve you're very harsh, I would say, about um, colleagues who are still there and are not on the barricades. And, and I, you have every right giving your story. But I was wondering, what do you advise <coughs> people to do? Like, so people like me, I'm being invited to Turkey regularly. Um, I never go when it is an official organization that is linked to the regime. But at the same time, as you know, there are many students uh, and faculty at universities which, in one way or another, collaborate with the regime, more when it's a public, less when it's a private, but still, um, and who feel very isolated and who feel that I mean, they are trying to create a, a different Turkey. Mm -hmm. Do we boycott Turkey? Do we go under which under which circumstances? Which limits? Uh, it's a very difficult um, choice to make because, well, let me start with your second question, and I'll definitely go back to the first comment. Um, um, as much as I am personally angry towards uh, anyone, almost anyone in society, because they have been emboldening a dictator uh, by supporting his narrative in media, in the opposition, in the parliament. Uh, and I think in time, we will realize how shameful these times are when things you know, settle down a little bit. Because this is, as someone who has been following Turkey, you should know that this purge has gone beyond, you know, um, nonsense. Has been the most unprecedented purge in Turkish history, and it go, it knows no border and, and everything. So uh, personally, I don't think I'm overreacting. But from a p perspective of a political analyst, I, I do believe that the other half of the country, which hates Erdogan and which secretly, quietly want this regime, the problem that everybody wants to g get rid of this government, I mean half of the country. The problem is everybody is expecting somebody else to do something. They just think that miraculously all of a sudden, every, because I see posts saying that, oh, we are going to see good days. You know, these liberal, seculars, you know, white Turks, you know, more affluent people within society, professors, uh, media people, even journalists, they share uh, nice pictures from Istanbul uh, with only veiled messages, we are going to see brighter days. How? As long as you support this uh, dictator's narrative and his demonization of p innocent people and labeling innocent people as terrorists, how is that going to be possible? And it's not limited to Gulen movement only, as you very well know. So uh, uh, I think, um, you know, yes, it's true. It's, it must be very difficult to stay in Turkey at the moment. But uh, it's even more maybe difficult for me to start to, to try to start over a new life here. Uh, as a journalist in exile, I have to worry about my immigration status, passport, uh, job, income, all sorts of issues. So I spoke up and I'm paying a heavy price. I'm not expecting everyone to go over the same path, but at least they could try not to uh, present uh, fleeing Turkey uh, by teenagers as a you know anti-terrorist activity, or they might try not to portray 14-year-olds as uh, terrorists, you know, who are linked to Gulen movement. So it's a choice. I mean, you might be, you might choose to remain quiet in the face of purge, but you might choose not to portray this specific incidents, for example, with that language. You could do much better, actually, even under under the dictatorship. Um, 
And uh, I, despite everything, uh, I think the European Union should engage because, um, and Americans and civil society. I mean, definitely the people, uh, the people who are in favor of a more democratic, liberal, secular Turkey, free Turkey, uh, th there is a significant, significant portion of society, true, and they probably leave, uh, you know, left alone. I feel left alone, but uh, they should not be. But it's a very, very difficult balance to strike, as you can imagine. Um, so instead of cooperating with the government, with the regime, you know, civil society organizations, uh, you know, other in initiatives could be supported. And I, I don't think you should, uh, I mean, of course, it's not my place to say what to do, for, uh, but uh, I, I think yours is a, a reasonable balance not to engage in the official propaganda activities of the government, uh, but you know, engage with civic society and academia. As far as the first part is concerned, um, the main problem with all oh, Guinness were allies of the government and they had their share of mistakes is not the fact that uh, Gulen movement or people who are, who are affiliated with the movement made mistakes. It's very possible. It's very likely that some people might have been in, uh, engaged in you know, unlawful activities as well. I can know that you have to definitely, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it needs to be investigated. The problem is there is this elusive enemy, elusive image, you know, like uh, a monster uh, that is everywhere, that is responsible for everything, but nobody really comes up with specific examples and specific people, specific institutions who have done wrong. So if people come up with specific examples and say that this prosecutor, this judge, this police officer, they have clear ties with the Gulen movement, or maybe they seem to be part of the Gulen movement, and this did, did, did this and that. But instead of, uh, instead of that, uh, even for the previous uh, editorial policy of the Man newspaper, people, especially the so-called leftists and seculars and liberals in Turkey, some of them, with tremendous degree of bigotry, uh, they refuse to listen what I have to say, what I have to uh, write, simply because I wrote for Zaman. They just, I know that they don't read, they haven't read, but they are so quick to judge and label. That's my problem. That's my problem. And uh, having, I, I, you know, having known uh, my own society, uh, I know that only, uh, only a small group of people are, have really, really uh, unbiased approach towards people from different walks of life because uh, they tend to assume that if we have some sort of religious lifestyle, you cannot be secular, which is not true, I think. But you cannot really challenge that idea because thanks to the indoctrination uh, you know, within the Turkish education system, it's a whole, it's a long debate. I'm willing to debate that, you know, later. I don't want to, you know, make it more complicated for the rest of the people. Uh, but I think I have reasons to be resentful towards Turkey's so-called intelligentsia. I didn't dispute that. Um, I said that there is a middle group. There's a, there's a group. We can't hear them, though. Yeah. And there's a group. Well, but in part, like, when you do speak out, you do pay that price, right? And there, there are two aspects here. First of all, that's a big price to pay. Not everyone is a hero, right? No, I'm not saying that I'm a hero. It's just that... You're to be a hero. But also, there is only that much you can do in exile, right? And so I have, I have friends who are, who are graduate students or professors in Turkey. If they speak out at a higher voice, they are no longer professors or graduate I know. Students, right? I'm fully aware of the situation. No, but that, exactly. But they have that, that situation, right? I mean, to a certain extent, you, you minimize your opposition by speaking louder because your platform becomes smaller. Because as professors, they can still influence their students. And you know that within certain universities, there is more space. Like I was there in May, I could speak freely about Erdogan, as did my audience, which were all Turks, um, and criticized Erdogan even at Istanbul University. Um, and so there is still that space. And I don't say in any way, shape, or form that. that there isn't an autocratic structure within it, but 
that gray zone is difficult to maneuver, I think. I see your point. Okay. Uh, okay, um, if there is no other question, um, I guess we could end. It's almost five. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, I know it's a depressing and bleak subject. Uh, sorry about that. I wish we could speak about more pleasant things like Turkish food, nice coast and beaches of Turkey. That's what I miss, the beaches in Turkey and the food. <laughs>